Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to have Rick Kenyon here. I've heard uh, a short version of this talk before, and already based on that, uh, you're in for a treat. <laughs> Rick, please. Thanks, Yuval. <clears throat> this is joint work uh, with my colleague, uh, Aaron Abrams. And uh, please feel free to interrupt if you have questions or comments or ideas. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to start with a, just a little story, sort of motivational story. <laughs> if you have a uh, string of lights, right, uh, all identical light bulbs, you, you hook, hook them up in series, and you put a battery across from one side to the other, then they'll all glow at the same rate, uh, at the same uh, brightness. But if you have a more complicated grid uh, like, a, for example, if you have an electric blanket or something, right, and uh, you have a bunch of resistors in some sort of network, some graph. Here it's a planar graph; doesn't have to be planar, but you know, and you know, you can hook up your battery at two locations, but then the the you know, not all the even if the bulbs are identical, the the amount of current that the, that the amount of voltage drop that one bulb is, is going to see is a function of all the other. Uh, resistances, and you know they won't all uh, be the same brightness, uh, right? So uh, the, the, one of the questions one can ask is, uh, can you design a uh, set of bulbs or set of conductances on the edges, set of resistances, uh, put in some you know s stronger bulbs here and, and weaker bulbs there or something, so that the uh, all the bulbs will glow at the same brightness, and and, and by Glowing at the same brightness, I mean the, the energy dissipated across each resistor is the same. Okay. So that, that is a solution in the linear case, but uh, you know one may wonder if there if it's if, if it's possible and uh, uh, how many solutions are there and so on. So. Uh, this is so to put this in a mathematical setting here. Uh, uh, this hopefully this is familiar to everybody. You know, stop me if you if it's not familiar. But I'm going to st start with the graph G, right? A uh, set of vertices and edges, and on each edge I'm going to have a positive real number called the conductance, uh, and uh, I'm going to there's a subset of the vertices B called the boundary vertices, and, and for most of the talk, it's just going to consist of two points, one at the top and one at the bottom, the boundary vertices. And uh, on the boundary, I have some function, let's call it u, some fixed function, fixed once and for all. And now we're looking for a function f on the rest of the graph, uh, f uh, on, the, on the vertices, which uh, is harmonic. In the, and harmonic means that the value at every point is the weighted average of the neighboring values. So weighted by the conductances on the edges. So if all the conductances are one, you know, it's just going to be the, the actual average of the neighboring values. And I want, of course, the function on the boundary to be equal to u. So that's a classical uh, Dirichlet problem. Here's the, by the way, the underlying uh, equation for harmonicity is this uh, weighted Laplacian. So the Laplacian of the, of the function f that we're, we're looking for is, is the sum of the f of x minus f of y. So you look at all neighbors. For each x, you look at the neighbors y of x, and you multiply f of x minus f of y times the conductance there. And you want that to be equal to 0 at every internal vertex x. All right. And uh, standard fact is that the, you know, the, there's a unique harmonic function with those boundary values, and it's given by, it, it's, it's the function which minimizes the so-called Dirichlet energy. And the Dirichlet energy is, by, by definition, the sum over all the edges of the graph, the conductance, times the difference of the function on the two vertices. Right? So for every, for every edge, uh, you look at the difference of the function, you square it, 
multiply by the conductance and you sum that up over all the edges, you get the Dirichlet energy. And we're going to call this quantity the edge energy, uh, the thing you're summing up. And uh, so one more ingredient uh, we need to discuss is the uh, so-called orient uh, orientation of the edges. Whenever you have a harmonic function on a graph, there's an induced current flow. In fact, if you think about the, the, you know, the, the current in the, in the light bulb example, right, the current is flowing from higher voltage to lower voltage. So uh, on every edge, there's an orientation which tells you which direction the current is flowing. You know, if, if I put a voltage 1 here and 0 there, and I let, let the thing relax to the equilibrium state, then the current will flow. This will be a source of current, this will be a sink of current, and then uh, at the intermediate uh, vertices, well, there won't be any sources and sinks in, in, the, in the graph because the current has to be, there's no loss of current in the interior, right? So uh, each interior vertex has to have some incoming and some outgoing arrows. Okay, well, there may be some edges which have no current, but uh, uh, at least if you choose sort of generic conductances, then they're, they're, th that won't happen. I mean, zero, having zero current is sort of a non-generic situation. All right, so that, that's uh, an orientation of the edges. It's an acyclic orientation, meaning that, you know, that it goes downhill, down, down potential. And uh, we're going to be interested in this set of acyclic orientations, which could potentially arise from these boundary values. So remember, we have a fixed bound, set of boundary vertices and a fixed uh, function u on the boundary. Uh, and uh, given that data, there's a certain set of acyclic orientations which can happen. And those, uh, it's not hard to show that uh, those are obtained from, well, okay, maybe I should have expanded this a teeny bit, but let's call capital sigma the set of orientations, acyclic orientation sigma. What I mean is by just a choice of orientation for each edge, such that, uh, well, which arise from functions on the vertices which have no interior extrema and are equal to u on the boundary. So look at functions which are equal to the u on the boundary, have no interior extrema, no maxima, maxes or mins inside, and then the, and who's such that the signature of the uh, derivative on, on an edge, that, I mean the, the direction of, of which the current would flow under f has to be equal to sigma. Okay, so that's a finite set of acyclic orientations, acyclic with, with, with uh, only sinks and sources on the boundary. Does, is that definition clear? What, what I mean by those kind of orientations. If you, if you only have uh, one source and one sink, like in this example, then uh, it's a set of all acyclic orientations with only that source and only that sink. Okay, so we, we are uh, going back to our original problem. Uh, we want to choose conductances so that we get whatever desired vector of energies we want, right? So let's call this map capital Psi, the map from, uh, uh, right, a, a vector of conductances, which are positive real numbers, to a vector of energies, right? So the en energies are always going to be non-negative. You know, for some special choices of conductances, you may get some current zero, and, and then the energy will be zero. So you have to include the left, the zero possibility over there. And just by way of example, right, here's a, the simplest uh, non-trivial graph you might consider, right, it's got two boundary vertices, V0 and V1, and, you know, we're just going to put uh, U is going to be 1 here and 0 there. So think of the current as, think of this circuit as being hooked up to a 1 volt battery across those two uh, vertices. And uh, let's call A through E are the five conductances. Right? And then you can write down an equation for the energies as a function of those five variables, A through E, the five conductances. And, you know, it's a little bit complicated, uh, but there it is. Right? That's the energy on edge one, energy on edge two, and so on, energy up to energy five. And, you know, how do you invert this equation, right? Now, if I give you a set of energies, can you solve this for A1 through A, uh, I mean, A through E? That's the question. It's just an algebraic, algebraic question now, uh, right, invert this mapping. 
And you know, I did I just just you know for illustration, I did it in this particular case. It's not actually so easy, right? I wouldn't want to do this by hand, but the c computer could handle this this example. And uh, I just uh, if you look at this equation here, this so there's I took five energies e little e one through e five, and I solve for a. So the, this is an equation. Uh, what's a polynomial in square root of a, quadratic polynomial in square root of a, uh, which determines a as a function of the five energies. And, uh, well, so it turns out... There's some homogeneity, right? So if you scale everything up, we should... Scale. That's right. If you, stay, if you scale all the conductances by a constant, then... Uh, uh, so you get the same energy. You get the same energy scaled also okay. by the constant squared. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, well, by the same constant, in fact. So, uh, yeah, so there's one, one fewer parameter than is apparent. <laughs> than look. But nonetheless, uh, uh, it, this is kind of interesting. If you, if you, if you stare at this equation a, a little bit, for, well, for one thing, it's, it's not completely obvious, but there are two roots. It's a quadratic equation. You know, if there's one root, then there's going to be another root. Uh, uh, both roots are positive. Right, because you can tell that these are the you know the constant and the quadratic coefficient are, are positive numbers, right? So in fact, there there are two solutions to A, <coughs> and in fact, uh, if you invert this for any set of energies, there are exactly two solutions, which also happens to be the number of uh, acyclic orientations of this graph. You know, if I look at an acyclic orientation, which is which has a source here and a sink there, then there's two possibilities, right? The the center guy. Can be direct. I mean, these A and B have to be down. D and E have to be down. C can go either way. So it's not really surprising that there are two solutions here, but uh, there are. And you know, that's the general statement: is that uh, uh, if you have any uh, acyclic orientation which is compatible with the boundary, and you, whatever your favorite choice of energies are, which are positive, I forgot to say positive here strictly positive, then there's a unique choice of conductances which realizes that data. Okay, there's a unique choice of conductances for which the associated harmonic function realizes this data. So in particular, if you, if you want all the energies to be one, for example, then the number of different choices of conductances, number of solutions to that equation is exactly the number of acyclic orientations, which, you know, some people are interested in, you know, counting acyclic orientations of graphs. This is one, sort of one way to do it is to, is to s s find the number of solutions to this equation. All right, and uh, so David Aldis had an idea for a book: uh, complicated solutions <laughs> to easy questions. <laughs> this is actually an NP hard question, so uh, you know you shouldn't uh, dismiss it too quickly. <laughs> But yeah, so I, I understand, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, well, so if you like a number theory or algebraic geometry, you may be interested in some topological features of this rational map. The rational map of the t type that I that I you know gave an example on the previous slide. You can think of it just as a map from complex numbers to complex numbers, right? You don't have to restrict to positive real numbers. And then it has a, you know, you can show that actually the topological degree is exactly the number of solutions, the number of acyclic orientations. So this, this theorem has, is, is a stronger than theorem one uh, because it says that there are no other solutions besides other than the real ones, the, the, the ones that are given by theorem one. In a way, but it doesn't imply theorem one. No, it doesn't imply, no, okay, so I shouldn't say stronger, I should say, um, well, it gives you more information about what's going on. <clears throat> but uh, in particular, if you if you plug in uh, if you if you have rational boundary values u, and suppose that you're interested in finding rational energies, for example, all the energies one, which is sort of the natural solution and that natural condition that we're, we're looking for, then uh, the you know you're solving this algebraic system of polynomial equations. Uh, every, for every uh, Galois automorphism of the, you know, a absolute Galois group, the group of totally, the group of algebraic numbers, will give you a new solution. Because all the, 
because the rational function has rational coefficients, uh, the Galois group uh, permutes the solutions. In fact, the Galois group, uh, the relevant Galois group here is just the group of the totally real algebraic numbers. Uh, because you never see, everything is always real. The solutions are always real. Uh, you never have to deal with complex numbers. Anyway, that's just a, something that might interest number theorists. Okay, any questions about the statement? So in order to uh, illustrate or draw pictures of these solutions, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a nice uh, construction due to, uh, well, uh, these four author paper, Brooks, Smith, Stone, and Tut, and they called it a Smith diagram. Apparently it was discovered by one of the, those four people in the late 30s. And uh, Smith, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so suppose I have a planar graph now, uh, and uh, it's got a harmonic function on it, right? And then, so from that, you can draw a uh, tiling of a rectangle. Uh, well, okay, so this is the case when the boundary just consists, again, just consists of two vertices, the v0 and v1. Then you can draw a tiling of the rectangle, which uh, geometric geometrically realizes that harmonic function. And uh, uh, it goes as follows. You, uh, uh, well, for each edge in the graph, you're, you're going to have a rectangle over here. And I've, colored, I've, I've labeled the rectangles according to the edges over there. And for each vertex over here, there's a horizontal segment in the sort of maximal horizontal segment in the union of the rectangle boundaries. And so uh, each rectangle over here has an upper boundary and a lower boundary, and those, that corresponds to the two vertices which that edge uh, uh, connects. And the, you know, the lower boundary is the V0, and the upper boundary is V1. And the, the, uh, so far, it's just that, that's the top logical description of the tiling. But, but then the, once you have a harmonic function on the graph, then you can assign a height to all the uh, rectangle boundaries, which is the corresponding voltage of the interior vertices. The, the, the value of the harmonic function tells you the height, the y-coordinate here. Right, so the voltage is the y-coordinate, and the, the width of the rectangle is the amount of current going along that edge. So the, you, know, you, you have these boundary values, 1 and 0, and then you solve for the harmonic function, each edge has a certain current, so it has a certain, that corresponds to, that gives you the width of the rectangle. And, you know, for each vertex, the, the, the rectangles above it corresponding to the, to correspond to the current coming in, and the rectangles below correspond to the current coming out, and the sum of the current coming in equals the sum of the current coming out. Does that make sense? So the, the, the sum of the widths uh, above each each uh, edge is equal to the sum of the widths below the edge. That's the uh, Kirchhoff no, no, no loss of current uh, rule. Okay, and uh, so if you know the if you know the width and the height, you can get the aspect ratio of the rectangle that corresponds to the conductance. The the width divided by the height is the conductance. That's what we've been calling the conductance. And the energy is the uh, height times the width, that's the area of the rectangle. So the, you know, if you, if you ask for a solution with a, where, where the combinatorics fits the graph and all the rectangles have the same area, this is, you, you've solved for the harmonic function which has the correct, all the energies equal. Okay. Is that clear? Is that, how many people know this construction already? Have you? Okay, and of course you can read off the orientation from the from the tiling because you know uh, you know for each vertex you know which which vertices are above it and which are below it. Okay, so now we can uh, just play the game. Uh, here's a here's a particular graph, it's sort of my running example. It's got uh, happens to have twelve acyclic orientations. And for each orientation, the theorem says there is a, because it's a planar graph, there is a tiling of a rectangle with all the rectangles of area one. That's that, and that's one of them. So it's, 
kind of a cute way to relate the energy, fixed energy problem to the uh, area, area one rectangulation problem. And um, what you see in this example is that, well, okay, so uh, it's, it's significantly more complicated to solve this system in this case. And, uh, you know, if you look at the width of the first rectangle there, the amount of, the amount of current going along that first edge, it's the root of some nasty, uh, quite large polynomial, which, you know, Mathematica spit out for me. Uh, And, you know, uh, I didn't spend much time uh, thinking about this, but each of these coefficients here uh, has some combinatorial meaning, some mysterious combinatorial meaning. Uh, uh, it's the, each of these coefficients is a positive polynomial in the energies. Here, the, all the energies are one, so that comes out to be an integer, but if I had written it out uh, as a, in t with 12 variable energies, E1 through E12, and you would see this is a that this coefficient is a positive polynomial uh, in all those things with, you with know, integer coefficients. With integer coefficients, yeah. And so, I, so there, there is some interesting combinatorial meaning, which uh, I wish I, but I don't know what it is. I mean, you kind of saw that in the in the previous example here, right? Each of these coefficients is has all the coefficients. All the coefficients are integers, and they're all all with the same sign. The signs alternate, but uh, okay. And as I said, in this case, there are twelve orientations, right? So there are twelve uh, uh, rectangulations, all sort of combinatorially equivalent to each other. But uh, you know, if you go back to this to this polynomial, this polynomial has twelve real roots, and the one of those roots is the width of this, of this tile. And the other 11 roots are the widths of the tile labeled number, tile number one in the, in, in the other 12 tilings. Because the, you know, the Galois group permutes the roots of that polynomial, it permutes the, the tilings as well. And it will move one of these tilings to some other tiling. I mean, it permutes these 12 objects. Always taking, you know, uh, if you look at all the, Widths of tile one, there's 12 widths, and they they together form the roots of that polynomial. It's kind of a kind of a cute, uh, very intriguing number theory uh, connection. I don't know if that this is a very useful observation or not, but uh, and yeah. Well, how many acyclic orientations does a graph have? Uh, I mean. What is the size of this thing, uh, this number of compatible acyclic or orientations of a graph? And well, uh, so this is something that people have studied, uh, and it's uh, in the if we we can add an edge between v0 and v1 if there's not one already, it doesn't really affect anything about the problem. Uh, uh, then the this number, the number of acyclic orientations compatible with these two boundary vertices is called the chromatic invariant of the graph. It's some, you know, reasonably well-studied uh, uh, graph invariant. Uh, it's the, you know, derivative at one of the chromatic polynomial, if you, if you happen to know what the chromatic polynomial is, or if you know what the tut polynomial is, it's the derivative at zero, the x derivative at zero. Uh, but in particular, it's an NP-hard thing to compute. But, you know, the yeah, in fact, you know, when I, when I, I just took this graph somewhat randomly, I plugged it into the Mathematica, I, I, it spit out this degree 12 equation, and I knew at that point that there were 12 solutions. So it, it, somehow it counted the number of solutions. It computed the number of solutions to this NB hard problem uh, <laughs> by some mysterious means, right? But let me, uh, let's move on. So, so, there were this theorem that the, the main theorem says that, you know, for every acyclic orientation and uh, set of energies, there is a solution. So, and the, the proof really just fits on one slide here. Uh, we're looking for a harmonic function, right? Here's the Laplacian. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not giving the conductances. The conductances are, are, are unknowns, but we can rewrite 
this Ce times dH as E over dH because the energy, the energy, remember, is the conductance times the dH squared. And so uh, instead of looking at our standard uh, harmonic equation here, right, we can rewrite the equation like this because the energies are what we are given. So now we have, now our, our, unknown become, our unknowns become the, the values of the harmonic function. So we have to solve this new equation, zero equals, uh, well, it's a system of equations, right, one for each vertex x. You sum over the neighbors of x, h of x minus h of y inverse times the energy. So we call this the n-harmonic equation, uh, which is short for energy harmonic, because we're given the energies rather than the conductances. And, uh, well, how do you solve this equation? Now it's a, it's a non-linear, right? We have to, you know, unfortunately it's no, no, no longer linear, but uh, it still has a, some nice properties. And one of, the, one of which is that the solutions are critical points of a certain functional, just like in the case of the harmonic equation, right, we had the Dirichlet energy was our nice uh, functional and the harmonic function was a minimal of the Dirichlet energy. Here the, here the solutions are critical points of the following functional, which is the product over the edges of the, you know, h of x minus h of y to the power the, of the energy, e, e sub e. Well, why is that true? Well, uh, you know, if you just differentiate this, take the logarithmic derivative of m, and you, uh, you know, and you get that for every, for, with respect to h of x, and you get this, this equation. Well, except for the, uh, you have to worry about the, the absolute value signs, which, well, what's going on at those absolute value signs? Well, that, that's, that's when the, you know, the thing is not differentiable, but, but it's only not differentiable when h of x equals h of y, Right, and that's a place where the, there's some edge with, with energy zero. So as long as you avoid the places where energy is zero, this is not gonna, you're not gonna have problems. And uh, in fact, uh, let's, we can uh, restrict ourselves to a certain set of functions, H. Let's restrict ourselves to the set of functions, H, uh, which have the correct orientation on each edge. Right, remember we have, uh, some, some boundary conditions, and uh, if we fix the orientation ahead of time, we're looking for a, f a, a solution which has this particular orientation. So we only need to consider functions h such that the value here and the value here, this one is bigger than that one. So that essentially determines for each absolute value sign which, which, which one is bigger, h of x or h of y. But that's, and, and it's also a polytope, it's a polytope of the set of functions with a fixed uh, signature, I mean, a fixed difference on, along each edge. And on that polytope, this function is in fact strictly concave because it's, well, if you take the logarithm, it's a sum of log of h of x minus y. Log is a concave function, it's a sum of concave functions, so it's concave. And because it's, well, strictly concave, and on this polytope, and on the boundary of that polytope, it goes to minus infinity because, uh, you know, the log of, Zero is minus infinity when you get to the, when you when you tend toward the boundary. So I guess the the relevant picture the relevant picture here is that if you look at the space of all possible functions h. It's it's divided up into these uh, polytopes like that, and uh, on each polytope the the function is strictly concave, and therefore has a unique. It goes to minus infinity on the boundaries and therefore it has a unique maximum. One inside each, one for each polytope. Okay? So that gives you, for every orientation, that is for every polytope, a unique maxima, maximizer. Okay, and I just want to highlight this, this equation. This is gonna be the most important equation here, the inharmonic equation. Okay, well, okay, so theorem two is not, not also, very short. Uh, if, if you recall, theorem two says essentially that there are no complex solutions. All the solutions are real. Um, how do we see that? Uh, well, here's the equation we're trying to satisfy. The energies are positive real numbers. We're just trying to show that any solution to this equation uh, has h real. 
And there's a well-known theorem, the galf lucas theorem, says that if you have any polynomial p, the roots of the derivative of p are contained in the convex hull of the roots of p itself. Uh, anyway, some classical theorem. I, uh, the proof is like one line. It's on the next slide. So once you accept this theorem, uh, then you can see that uh, if h satisfies this, then h, h of x is a root of p prime of z, where p of z is this uh, polynomial here. You take the z minus the h of y, where h of y runs over the neighbors of x. Think of that as a function of z. It's, a, well, it's, it's almost a polynomial, except these may be you know, real numbers, but looks kind of like a polynomial. <laughs> Generalized polynomial. And uh, right, if you just differentiate p logarithmically, you get that equation for h of x. So that implies uh, that, by the Gauss-Lucas theorem, that h of x has to be in the convex hull of the neighboring values, the h of y's. So on my graph, you know, for every point, the, the value of h at any point is, is inside the convex hull of the, ba the boundary value, its neighboring values. But all the boundary values are, are real numbers, and therefore everything has to be real. Right? If, if, if anybody had a positive imaginary part, for example, then you could find a neighbor which had at least as large imaginary part and so on. Essentially the maximum principle. Okay. Is there a clock here? Does anybody want to see the proof of Gauss-Lucas theorem? <laughs> somebody showed this to me. I was not, was this somebody in, my, in this room? Was it you, Yale? No. no? <laughs> okay. Anyway, you can find it on Wikipedia. It's just one line. Uh, here's, here's my enharmonic equation. I just took the complex conjugate, right? But it's the same. It, because, you know, because the energies are real, uh, it's also true, right? Conjugate of 0 is 0. But then I multiply the numerator and denominator by h of x minus h of y, right? So the denominator now becomes real. This is real. And h of x minus h of y, those may be complex. but uh, then you put the h of x on the other side, and then it has a real coefficient here. And so what you see is that h of x is a convex combination of the h of y's. Right? The, this, this sum is equal to that sum without those guys. So the h of x is a convex combination of the h of y's, and therefore it's in the convex hull. Okay. Uh, that's pretty cute and very easy. Uh, all right, uh, let's see, maybe I'll skip this guy. Uh, well, okay, we can. I already gave you an example. But um, the nice thing about this uh, variational principle, this maximization uh, scheme, is that it's very easy to construct explicit examples. Now, so what I did here is I took a, a grid, a 40 by 40 square grid, right? I, I turned it uh, 45 degrees, and then, you know, I don't know why, <laughs> but I, I took one source here and one sink there. So you think of this as a, a, a very dense 40 by 40 grid. And I oriented all the arrows, uh, you know, south and west, what used to be south and west. And then given that orientation, you can ask, well, it, how do I find conductances so that all the energies are one? Or in other words, how, can I find a tiling of a rectangle uh, which has the combinatorics of the square grid such that all the rectangles have area one, and well, there it is. It's a unique solution once you fix the orientation, right? Uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's just a few seconds on your computer to, to maximize this thing. Uh, but, uh, yeah. what, what can you say about this? <laughs> I mean, there's lo there are lots of questions if you like geometry. Now, uh, you know, is this sort of converging to some interesting mapping? So this, this is really, uh, you can think of this as some sort of mapping from the diamond shape to the square, which, right, which, you know, the top vertex sort of goes to the top boundary, but, uh, you know, it's sort of continuous inside. Each, each little unit of area here goes to some unit of area in the square. It's an area-preserving mapping, uh, but, you know, I don't actually know what mapping that is. It converges to. Uh, be, it would be kind of interesting to find out. 
but you know you can play you can play around with these things because it's very easy to uh, uh, do local deformations, right? Uh, here, here I just imposed a, a row shape on that previous fixture, and then I, I, I suppose, you're, suppose you're interested in some, you know, property of that picture near some location. You can just re, re uh, uh, so solve for the solve for the tiling, which which increases the area of some rectangles, some rectangles near the area near the region of interest. Right? That's what I did here. Is I, I just blew up the areas of some of those rectangles according to some, you know, and and so this part of the picture blows up. The rest of the picture gets a little bit smaller, uh, but it's a it's a interesting sort of uh, deformation, uh, which is you know not conformal. Which is that's why it's I think it's kind of interesting and novel, right? Okay, and yeah, you can. Here I'm just playing around with these things. This is a sequence. You know, if I just change the area of one of the rectangles, you can see how the other rectangles sort of move in that under that deformation. So it turns out that there is a nice uh, scaling limit of these uh, mappings, right? If if I take a larger and larger, or a finer and finer grid, and I do the same uh, mapping into a rectangle, I can I can see what happens as the as the mesh size goes to zero, and you do get some very interesting uh, solution in the end. That is, the, the, the functions converge, and they converge to some analytic functions which satisfy the following uh, sort of twisted uh, Cauchy-Riemann equations. You know, here u and v are the x and y coordinates of the image, x and y are the x and y coordinates of the domain, and the u and v have to satisfy these, uh, this system of PDEs here, which resemble the Cauchy-Riemann equations for complex analysis, but they're nonlinear. Yes? From this movie, um, does it say that these permutations that you showed in the slide where there were three by four of them, that if you make a small modification, then it's kind of local? I understand. Yes. If you make a small modification of the orientation, then I believe, I haven't proved anything to this effect, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's true that uh, the picture will just change locally, like you say. That is the, the effect of, uh, so what I did when, when, with the big picture is I took the uh, sort of a nice periodic orientation where all the edges were oriented south and west. But what AL is suggesting is, what, you know, what happens if I just change the orientation of a single edge? Will the picture change in a in a drastic way or will change in a local way, and I think it just changes in a very s small location, sort of exponential decay of influence there. But I don't know how to analyze that. So yeah, the, so the, the usual Cauchy-Riemann equations are over here. There are some nice linear things. Here I got the, that's the constant conductance Laplacian or you know analytic functions. Here's here's the Cauchy-Riemann equations in the constant energy case. You know they, they they do resemble it, but you know here the associated Laplacian is our, our friendly Laplacian. Here that there is a Laplacian mm, nonlinear. I don't know what to call that guy. If you have some good terminology for these things, I'd be I'd appreciate it. We called it the n-harmonic Laplacian, but I don't know if that's good, any good. Either. <laughs> yeah, so both the real and imaginary part here satisfy the same, uh, just, just like in this case, right? The real and imaginary parts, U and V, both satisfy the same Laplacian equation. Same thing here, but uh, that doesn't mean I know how to solve this equation. Okay, and uh, you know, so just playing around here, I, I took a random orientation of the square grid and I packed it in a, in a rectangle with area one rectangles. Uh, of course, it's not so easy to find a random orientation. This is, uh, uh, there are no, you know, good algorithms for sampling a random orientation of a large graph, random acyclic orientation. But, uh, so I cheated a little bit here, but it's the best I could do. <laughs> I used some Glauber dynamics and, uh, and waited a long time. Yes? Is this rotated? Wouldn't we expect to see the very top line and the very bottom line to be the, the full width? I mean, look at all, all the previous examples, the, the very top one and the very bottom one are 
this is a slit that's the, the full yeah. width of the graph. I think what I did in this case is, I, I, I apologize, I took different boundary conditions, which is that I glued all the lower, the left and lower boundary to a single vertex and all the upper and right boundary to a single vertex. Don't look too closely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one thing you can so you do, just, which... You just flipped and censor the move if it created a cycle. Yes, that's right. That'd be right. So the, the, this is a well-known way to connect the space of orientations, bipolar, or, bipolar orientations, which is to choose an edge and reverse its orientation if it's allowed. Uh, one thing that is known that's a little bit... Uh, so, so this picture creates a bipolar disorder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So uh, if you don't fix the graph, but if you take a random graph with a random bipolar orientation, I should have said bi I start, should start saying bipolar because bipolar means there's a single source and a single sink. Uh, then uh, this, these objects are in bijection with some well-known combinatorial objects called Baxter permutations. People know how to count them. People know how to generate them. And here's a, uh, an exact random sample of a triangulation with, I don't know, 40,000 rectangles of a square, all equal area. So I don't know if you can see anything interesting going on here, but uh, I thought it was kind of pretty. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there are, some, there are things you can say in this case, but not, which we can't say in this case of the grid. And, you know, just uh, one last thing which I'm working on, and uh, hopefully we'll lead somewhere soon, uh, can we count the bipolar orientations of the grid, right? Remember, the bipolar orientations are acyclic orientations with no sources and sinks, or, or rather with just one source and one sink. Uh, and so here's a sort of a, a scheme, a plan of attack, right, using this technolo new technology. Right? So what I did is I took a cylinder, right, and I glued the left, all the vertices on the left to a single vertex, which is going to be my sink, and all the vertices on the right, that's going to be my source. And right, so now I'm interested in how many, you know, orientations are there where there's, with that sink and that source, that source and that sink. And the, uh, the theorem says all I have to do is count the number of solutions to that enharmonic equation, right? The, every solution gives you a unique orientation and, vi and vice versa. So, uh, so let's call xij the value of the n-harmonic function at, at an interior vertex ij. And then we, get, we can get a recurrence relation, right? Because the value here just depends on the four neighbors, right? The, the value to the right is, I can think of that as a function of these four guys. It's a, it's a rational function of these four guys. So you get a recurrence xi plus 1j is equal to xij plus this uh, rational expression, right? So, uh, we start with some initial data here on the first row, and then all the other all the other points de de just depend on those on those on the values on the first row. And at the end, you want them all to be equal to one, x you know n plus one comma j. So using this recurrence, we can write x i j as a rational function of the x's on the first row on the first uh, column there. And there are techniques for counting the number of solutions. So, so then you get some, at the end of the day, you get some, I mean, when you get to the end of the cylinder, you get some system of equations. You have to set them all equal to one. And, you know, algebraic geometers know how to do this, right? Uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna compute the number of solutions to some big polynomial system, uh, it's the, you know, the mixed volume of their Newton polygon, Newton polytopes. And uh, the, the essential uh, thing to do is to is to see s compute the growth rate of xij as a rational function of the initial data, and uh, I spent some time doing this calculation, <laughs> and but unfortunately it came out too big, so I probably made a mistake. But uh, it seems to grow as four to the i, which s w would indicate that there are four to the four to the v where V is the number of vertices uh, orientations, but that's clearly too big because, uh, you know, if you just orient each edge both either way, then that's already four per vertex. So that's too, way too many. So I probably just missed something obvious, but uh, it seems, I mean, I feel like 
that should be something I can comp complete sometime soon. Okay, well, unless people have questions, I have just one last uh, open, interesting open uh, generalization, not, not generalization, but uh, related problem, which is uh, about triangles, right? Since we, since we dealt with uh, uh, rectangulations uh, with area one rectangles, uh, you can ask, is there a analogous result for triangulations um, in fact, this, the reason I mentioned this is because this was actually our motivating problem, right? Aaron asked me this question about triangles, which is sort of an old problem, and I suggested that we look at rectangulations because they're often easier. Um, but so, the, so, right? For example, if I take this triangulation of rectangle, can, there, there are seven triangles. Can I assign the areas arbitrarily? And the answer is no. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you why the answer is no, but the, here's a related question, uh, sort of well-known among people who know it well, the, the theorem of Monsky, which says that there, um, you can't dissect a square into an odd number of equal area triangles. This is a fun, fun question uh, to think about if you, if you don't believe it. <laughs> and the, the reason it's so mysterious is that the, the proof uses the axiom of choice. This is what? Axiom of choice. What? Axiom <laughs> of choice. The proof <laughs> uses the axiom of choice. Axiom of choice. Axiom of choice, yeah. But, uh, right, so for example, here's a triangulation with nine triangles. Right? And it does pretty well. <laughs> right? So the area of each triangle is not quite one ninth, but it's pretty close. How close can you get to the function of the number of triangles? So there's a paper. That, this was taken from a paper, and I, I apologize for forgetting the reference, but I have the reference on my computer. I will pull it up after, afterwards. So yeah, that's an interesting question. How close can you get as a function of the number of triangles? Well, we can't get arbitrarily close. There will be some compactness issue or something. That's, that's right. You can't get arbitrarily close. So there's some gap. But we don't, I don't know what the gap is. But uh, uh, sometimes you, there are solutions. And uh, sometimes there are combinatorially equivalent solutions, just like in the case of rectangles. Uh, so here's two triangles which, which you know, if you define the combinatorics appropriately, they are combinatorially equivalent. Right? Each, I tried to label them so you could kind of see what's going on. Uh, basically what you have to do is, is uh, so you see this, this edge, this edge here, which is adjacent to triangles four, six, and seven. There's an edge over here which is adjacent to triangles four, six, and seven, two. But the you know, you should think of this black edge as some sort of degenerate triangle, right? It's got three, three vertices on it, and they, they sort of, this is also a triangle with three vertices on it. So that, that's, there, there's some sense of how these are combinatorially equivalent, and y y sometimes you can get two solutions, sometimes you get many solutions, but the number of solutions, unlike the case of rectangulations, the number of solutions is not always constant. Sometimes there are complex solutions, Sometimes there are no solutions. So, uh, so this is this is still we still don't really know anything about this problem. But uh, there is a nice uh, analog of the harmonic function uh, square tiling. The relation between this, the the network and the and the tiling. And here, instead of uh, talking about a symmetric Markov chain, we, we do an asymmetric Markov chain, so the, so you have a, you still have a, gra a planar graph, uh, each, each edge has a, in this case it's a mark, think of it as a Markov chain rather than a resistor network, but it's, uh, other than that it's roughly, it's, it's fairly equivalent, let's, let's have two outgoing, outgoing arrows from each vertex, except for the top and the bottom, and uh, well, okay, I don't know if I need to go, what? 
Oh, sorry. Just what about green. the green one and the red one? Oh, no, sorry. Two out. Okay. Two out. The number of in is not specified. Oh, the number of in is not specified. Okay. But so, so the way you, the, the way the mapping works, th this mapping uh, always works, is you, you take each triangle. Let, let's let's uh, uh, rotate the picture so that n no, there are no horizontal edges except maybe the bottom in this picture. <laughs> Okay, so just taking sort of generic rotation so there are no horizontal edges. Then each triangle has three vertices, you know, a top one, a bottom one, and a middle one. And from the middle one, you draw this uh, dotted line. And so each, for each triangle there, there's a vertex over here. And the, the, you can think of the, the top part of the triangle as, as having an outgoing arrow to the upper and an outgoing arrow to the lower one. So the green triangle which, which corresponds to the green vertex, connects to the purple one and to the bottom, like here. And then there's a way to assign, uh, you know, transition probabilities to the edges. Let's see, it should be down here. Uh, well, so, so every geometric concept over here corresponds to some probabilistic concept in this, in this uh, network. Uh, the y-coordinate over, y -coordinate over there is a harmonic function. Harmonic function is one which is, you know, the value at a point is the average of the weighted average of the neighbors. The uh, the here, you know, each each edge has a slope, and the slope corresponds to the the winding number of a, a random walk. You take a very long random walk where you add an edge from the top to the bottom, and you, you ask for the expected winding number around a face, and that that gives you the slope over there, and so on. The areas are the energy. So, so there's this kind of nice, nice uh, bijection, just like in the previous case. And, and one hope is that we can use somehow use this bijection to to say something interesting about the existence of uh, or non-existence of uh, fixed area rectangle uh, triangulations in that case. But hasn't been done yet. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Questions or comments? Yeah. Um, so in the problem with dividing the square into equal area triangles, is it yeah. that if you assume the axiom of choice, you actually can do it? No, no. Uh, the, the theorem is that there's no dissection. Right, but in order to prove that, you need the axiom of choice. So if you assume the, the negation, you are claiming the negation of the axiom of choice. No one has. No one has a. Uh, well, okay. To say that the proof uses the axiom of choice is a little bit too strong because, yeah. well, is it too strong or not? So no one has been able to give one. <laughs> so there are, you there can't are where we know that you need the axiom of choice. This is not one of them, right? There's no proof that you can <laughs> prove it without the axiom of choice. That's right. That's right. It may be possible to prove it without the axiom of choice. Thank you. <laughs> Every time you use integration, the big integration, you also use the axiom of choice. <laughs> no. <laughs> My computer does not use the axiom of choice when it integrates a function. <laughs> Can you construct the big measure without the axiom of choice? No, I never need to construct the big measure. Yeah, I know. Any other comments or questions? If not, let's thank Rick again. Yeah.